ओके हेलो एवरीबॉडी आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आयुका टू द फर्स्ट पब्लिक टॉक ऑफ द डेकेड एंड टू स्टार्ट इट ऑफ इट्स नॉट स्टार्टेड इट वन मोर यूजली दे स्टार्ट इट नाउ um and so to start of this year at least uh, we have bhuvnesh jain uh, who is an eminent cosmologist and astrophysicist uh, bhuvnesh is currently a professor at the university of pennsylvania and he is a co-director of the penn center for particle uh, cosmology uh, he did his phd from mit uh, in 1994 with alan guth and ed bertschinger uh, thereafter he pursued his postdoctoral studies at mpa munich uh then at Johns Hopkins University uh before finally landing a faculty position at UPenn uh and he has been there since 2001 uh Bhuvnesh has a broad range of expertise uh he is an expert in gravitational lensing um and he has um used gravitational lensing in order to uh learn a lot about cosmology uh things related to modifications of gravity galaxy clusters and so on Uh, he has held leadership positions in a number of ground based imaging surveys as well as space based surveys uh, but today he is going to talk about the iconic image of the black hole that was released in april last year um, and i'll just uh, lend the uh, lend the podium to him right thank you this can be uh, make our mobile devices silent thank you Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be giving this talk in Pune and at Ayuka. Thank you for turning your mobile phones off. In case you forget, I'll follow my colleague's rule that if you get a phone call and there's a Bollywood song, I get to answer it. Okay. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about black holes, uh, even though that's not something I worked on because I was so excited when this image came out in April. Uh, you know, as you may know, astronomers have been convinced not only that black holes are predicted by Einstein's gra theory of gravity, but that we have uh, seen them through our telescopes in quite a few different ways. We've been convinced about this for decades because of many indirect ways that uh, that we see a black hole. But when this image came out. and we were attending uh, you know we were watching it at the press conference and they put this image up all professional hardened astronomers were quite likely to be tearing up it was such a visceral and emotional moment for us so i want to tell you a little bit about that story the image is quite simple right there's the black hole in the middle there's the dark patch around it and a ring a ring of light it looks like but as we'll see it's not quite a uh, light of the usual kind so before we discuss this <coughs> let's ask what is a black hole a black hole is a place in space where gravity is so strong that even light can't escape because matter has become so dense that its gravity pulls anything that gets too close to it it pulls it in um and even photons the particles of light if they get close enough to this black hole they'll just spiral in or fall straight in so there's this point of no return in three dimensions it's really a surface let's call the event horizon i know there are some students and people comfortable with mathematics so the formula for the radius of this event horizon is 2 gm over c square everybody good with 2 g newton's constant c squared c is the speed of light 300000 kilometers per second and m is the mass of the black hole i'll tell you a trick if you um haven't uh, been aware of it if the sun were to form a black hole its radius would be 3 kilometers okay it's so the event horizon of the sun would be so small you know its radius is 700000 kilometers right now you'd have to crush it inside a radius of 3 kilometers 
and then it would collapse to the center, form a black hole, and this three kilometers would be this invisible boundary. So it's less than the distance from here to the airport. All that mass inside. Uh, so that means that if you think about some other kind of black hole, like the black hole we're going to talk about is six billion times bigger than the sun. So its event horizon radius is six billion times three, 18 billion kilometers. If you really were upset with somebody and you had some superpowers, you could convert them to a black hole. Okay. And if their mass is about uh, 100 kilograms, then their event horizon radius would be that much smaller compared to the mass of the sun. So it's easy to calculate the event horizon of a black hole. This picture shows it. You know, it's got this nice blue <coughs> sphere, uh, you know, frame around it, and a star in the middle. Of course, you wouldn't see anything if it was a black hole there would just be this boundary that you wouldn't know about, you know, until you crossed it. So, uh, to think about what is a black hole, it's useful to do the thought experiment of what happens when you fall in. I found this account on the internet, which I liked. Once you ran out of fuel, so, you know, if you were in a spaceship going to a black hole, or succumbed to space madness and turned off the engines, you would spiral into the black hole's event horizon, a boundary beyond which nothing, not even light, can escape. From there, you'd have a date with destiny. Nothing you could do would stop your inexorable journey towards the singularity, a core of infinitely distorted space-time, where physics as we know it curls up in a ball and whimpers. <laughs> kind of poetic, right? Time around you would flow less like greased lightning and more like a sap on a cold February morning. I wanted to add one more point about it. So I was like, should I try to be, you know, literary like this guy? What I wanted to say is, and warped space-time bends light rays, so you see some crazy things. In my first pass, instead of things, there was another word that's not family-friendly. So I was showing this to my daughter, who's 10 years old. <coughs> she said, it's a good thing you became a scientist and not a writer. <laughs> Life is tough with a 10-year-old. You have to really fight to preserve your self-esteem. So uh, what would actually happen <coughs> if you fell into a black hole? There's this concept that, um, that's called spaghettification. You know, gravity around a black hole is very strong. So even before you get to the event horizon, you start to feel these forces. And so if you're uh, an astronomer who's, you know, deciding to take a spacewalk outside your spaceship, this could happen to you. Someone else on the internet said, spaghettification is all fun and games until you're the spaghetti. What it, why? Because in a matter of seconds, you are gone, or reduced to a string of disconnected atoms that march into the black hole singularity, like ants disappearing into a colony. So that's a pretty good picture. <coughs> what would happen is that, uh, you know, say you were falling feet, feet first towards the black hole, then the, f wow, this light is, um, then the, the force of gravity on your feet would be stronger than on your head. Usually we don't notice it. As you get closer and closer to the black hole, this force would get stronger and stronger. So it would start to stretch you. And then at some point, the weakest part of your body, which is about around your belly button, it wouldn't be able to resist it. You'd split into two. And you would watch your feet you know, going down and getting further stretched and further separated at the next weakest point. At the same time, your torso would be getting separated. So it's not a pretty picture. If uh, some of you have nightmares uh, tonight, you know, my apologies in advance. But on the plus side, <coughs> there's this great book that describes these exp uh, uh, this kind of thought experiment by Kip Thorne that says that, you know, if you had done your math right and you stopped well before this business happened, then you could circle around the black hole and what does bending of space-time mean? 
it means that uh, you get contracted, you appear to be contracted, and time really flows slowly. In the sense that if you hung out around a black hole, you would notice that much if you kept a safe distance, but when you ca came back, if you had a twin sister, you would be back much younger than your sister. So if you, you know, if you waited a decade on Earth time, you could come back and be only a month older. In the movie Interstellar, um, they use this, uh, this point to make some interesting uh, stories. There's something else that happens near a black hole. I'm sorry, I wanted to add one more point about this, especially for the high school students. That, um, that um, the gravity around a black hole, sorry, uh, the gravity around a black hole is actually much more benign for a bigger black hole. So the black hole that we're going to talk about that's billions of times bigger than the sun, um, the, the gravitational force around it, there's no spaghettification you would feel. It's quite, uh, it's quite mild. So you would go cross the event horizon, be of some ways into it. If you were freely falling like an elevator that's falling down, you would just feel weightless and you would have no idea you've crossed the point of no return. It's smaller black holes, black holes that are formed by dead stars that are more vicious in that sense, that there the tidal forces are stronger. And that's because, in case you're curious about the math, the tidal forces go like m over r cubed, and because the event horizon goes like m, m over r cubed is like 1 over m squared, so the strength of the tidal force is inversely related to the mass of the black hole. That's about all the mathematics I'm doing today. I wanted to talk about gravitational lensing because, of course, you can't see the black hole. Light can't escape from it. So the way we look for black holes is we look for stuff falling into them. And when stuff is falling into them, we are talking about looking at the light of stuff that's going to fall into the black hole. That light doesn't take a simple straight path to us. It's bent by the warped space around the black hole, so a light ray at the top that's at a safe distance is bent slightly. A light ray that is too close to the black hole goes through the event horizon never to be seen again, and there's this magic distance at which a light ray will execute a circular orbit, possibly into eternity uh, if the black hole doesn't grow, um, and just go round and round the black hole. This is a picture from that movie Interstellar, which shows what would actually happen if you looked at a black hole in which stuff was falling. This movie used you know, professional simulations to show what, uh, what we'd expect, and they weren't far from what the black hole image showed. Let's look at this animation. So this is showing a black hole, the shadow in the middle, and there's a galaxy behind it, and the black hole is moving relative to the galaxy. This shows the galaxy moving, you know, you can think of it as the black hole moving across the galaxy. So as the galaxy gets closer, its shape is distorted due to this lensing effect. What else do you notice? Before it gets close, there's already a, a second image forming around the black hole. So lensing will produce multiple images, you know, one ray being gently bent and another ray going under the black hole and coming out. So you get two copies of this image. The mathematics of a black hole is very clear. <clears throat> so you can make regular optical lenses that do the same job as a black hole. So this is a, a lens whose distorting effect is identical to that of a black hole. So uh, there's another copy of it that's going to be passed around, and you can play with it. Uh, but in case you can see this, 
I usually have my students do it to each other, but today I don't have anybody on stage, so I'm going to have to mess up my own image to tell you how lensing works. So if, I was, if you were looking at my finger and a black hole passed in front of you, you would suddenly see two copies and then an Einstein ring and so on. So it's pretty straightforward, the lensing effect of a black hole. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, so lensing is one thing that is involved in understanding this black hole image. The other piece of it is, what's the thing that's falling into the black hole? This thing is gas. So this, this black hole, as we'll see in a, in a minute, is sitting at the center of a galaxy. And there's hot gas floating around. It's pulled in by the gravity of the black hole. It's sped up. As it's sped up, it gets heated. Its temperature goes up to a billion Kelvin. So it's very hot. It's glowing. And it's swirling around the black hole. As it approaches the black hole and swirls around, for those of you who've studied conservation of angular momentum, you know that it's got to go faster and faster and faster. And as it goes faster, it's going to emit more and more radiation through a variety of processes. So um, this is a simulation of gas that's swirling around a black hole and falling in. So you can see that there's a lot of violent events going on. Bits and blobs of gas are disrupted and ejected, and some of them are you know, brighter, some of them are less bright, and there's also this lensing going on. So there are moments in this movie where it looks like the actual image that's seen. I'll show you a frozen moment later. So this gas, the light is bent by the black hole, and there's another effect, which is Doppler beaming. So if you're standing on a street and a police uh, siren or an ambulance goes by, you know, the siren gets louder and louder and it really hurts your ears. And the moment it passes, the frequency of sound drops. It becomes, the pitch becomes lower and it doesn't bother your ears as much. Similarly, radiation from something that's moving towards you uh, becomes more energetic. And when that blob of gas is moving at the speed of light, there is a much stronger Doppler effect, uh, the relativistic Doppler effect, that can make it enormously brighter. So the combination of this lensing, the bending of light, and the Doppler beaming of the radiation are responsible for the look of this image. The reason one side is brighter than the other is because that's the part that's moving towards us. And the reason that it looks like a ring, there's a very surprising thing about this image. You know, you can imagine that if there's a black hole and there's a ring around it, you'd think we'd have to be lucky so that the ring is, you know, perpendicular so that we can see it on the sky. Otherwise, you wouldn't see that hole in the middle. But that's not actually true. Regardless of which way the ring is oriented, I'm not sure you can see me well enough. Regardless of the way it's oriented, the bending of light would make it appear like a ring on the sky with the shadow in the middle. Uh, did you want to do the angular momentum thing? So there's a simple uh, demonstration that shows you that as uh, this uh, angular momentum conservation business, that as you fall in closer, you have to spin up faster. So you can see the big ball is making the little ball get, um, get closer and closer. And as it does that, it speeds up. And of course, you've seen all that you know, if, uh, in other contexts. So out of, that, out of a bunch of movies like that, the Event Horizon Telescope team, which made the image of the black hole, 
found a number of situations in which the image uh, that they expect of a black hole in Einstein's gravity to look more or less like the observed image. Of course, this comparison is complicated. You have to factor in the effect of the instrument and, um, and other things. But if you smooth this image, you can see that it looks like that. So let's take <clears throat> one more look at this image. The name of, of the galaxy where this black hole lives is M8, it's called M87 after uh, an astronomer, Messier. Um, it's a, it's a well-known galaxy. The black hole's in the middle. This is the image taken on April 11, 2017. At various other times, it looked slightly different. It's, you know, it's brighter here and so on. But it's quite consistent. And the temperature of the gas, as I mentioned, is in billions of degrees Kelvin. So we're going to discuss a couple of other things. First is, what makes a black hole supermassive? Supermassive refers to black holes that are million or billion times the mass of the sun that live in the centers of galaxies. So it all begins with a single star, a star that's, say, 10 times bigger than the sun. After it uses up all its fuel, it dies in the sense that it can no longer sustain all the gas around it. The gravity causes the gas to collapse in. It forms a black hole. A bunch of such black holes find each other, they, they, they merge, and grow bigger. And then through a process that is still being explored theoretically, we don't have a firm understanding of it, there's a sequence of such merger, mergers that forms a much bigger black hole, thousands or e times bigger than, than a single black hole. There's more of these mergers. Gal small galaxies collide with bigger galaxies. The central black holes merge with other central black holes. So this is a picture of two spiral galaxies. This is a big one, like the Milky Way. This is a smaller one. They're on their way to a violent collision. And the black holes that are almost certainly at the centers of these galaxies will merge together and get grow bigger. So to get to six billion solar masses, it's not easy. It takes all of you know the age of most of the age of the universe, to, uh, you know roughly ten billion years to get that big. This is the galaxy that we are talking about, Messier 87. It's a elliptical galaxy. It 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 has almost certainly had a violent past involving such mergers, but now it looks you know pretty peaceful. It's got uh, billions of stars. And then in the center, uh, you can see a little jet. You look at it a little closer. So if you zoom in, you see an extremely long jet. And this jet and other observations of this galaxy ha had already told us that it's, very, it's almost certainly hosting a black hole which is almost certainly billions of times bigger than the sun. So this Event Horizon team was formed with this dream that we're going to go after the most promising, most massive black holes and try to get a high resolution image. And everybody's got indirect evidence of different types of black holes, but we want to actually see it. And actually seeing it means getting pretty much to the event horizon. So they, this is a slide from them. They actually thought they would get to the black hole in our Milky Way first. So that's what's on the slide. The way they did it, it is a global effort. So. Excuse me, I, for a moment I was confused because the time on my computer is Philadelphia time. <laughs> so I was like, I'm really running late or early. Um, 
So, uh, so, the, so they use radio telescopes, and there's a huge network of them around the world. They used eight of these to, to get this image. So let's talk about how they did that. This is one of those eight telescopes. These are radio telescopes. Does it look like one telescope? These are 66. That count as one, <laughs> OK? <laughs> because it's one of their sites. And it's, it's probably the most important site. Um, so this is high in uh, the mountains of Chile. All of these telescopes are in extremely inhospitable locations. And the reason is that we need to be as high and as dry as possible for the Earth's atmosphere not to mess up these observations. So there's uh, you know, eight such sites, uh, Hawaii, Chile, Arizona, uh, Mexico, Spain, I forget um, all the ones that they used. There's, m there's more listed here that, that might join this network. And then there's this trick called radio interferometry. The idea is that you take a signal, measure at one location, a second location, a third location, and y y you're observing the same part of the sky. You take the signal, and then you process it, and then you want to combine it. Here they're showing, a they're showing airplanes, but they actually had to use trucks because there was so much data. So they get it all together, and then there's this thing called, um, you know, to synchronize the signal, they use correlators, they're called. And all of this data, it's like petabytes of data, is used to construct this very simple image. Okay? This image literally has, you know, three numbers describe almost all the image. The size of the ring, the thickness of the ring, and the fact that it's about 10 times brighter on one side than the other. So we have to go to all this trouble just to get a simple image like this because we wanted resolution. You know, you've heard that, you've probably heard that the Hubble Space Telescope, which is out in space above the atmosphere, is the best telescope in the world. It produces the prettiest, highest resolution pictures. But that's not quite true. For some purposes, you can <coughs> leave the optical, you know, the visible light that we see with, and go to other wavelengths, in particular radio, where this interferometry trick works, and you can gain higher resolution. So how do you do it? So usually it's just a matter of size. You know, the Hubble Space Telescope is the best telescope in visible light because it's got the biggest diameter flying in space. The bigger the diameter, the better your resolution. But the trick of interferometry is that you can take two telescopes that are quite far apart, and you can use the distance between them as the diameter, as long as you combine the signal very precisely at the right time. And radio waves are useful for this for a variety of reasons, but one simple one is they're long. Like a radio wave is this big, or this big, or that big. That's radio whereas optical light is like a million times smaller. So with these uh, longer waves, they take you know, a, a longer time for a wavelength to pass through. And as long as you record the moment the wave arrives at your telescope, so if this is the telescope in Hawaii, and this in Chile, and this is in Spain, you have to use atomic clocks. You can't use your iPhone. You have to use atomic clocks, which have a precision of, you know, better than a trillionth of a second to record when the signal reached. You do that for this place, this place, this place, you gather all this data, and you use that timestamp to combine the image. And once you do that, you achieve this magic, namely that you have all these sites, also the Earth is rotating. So basically, you have the entire diameter of the Earth, more than 10,000 kilometers, as your baseline of your telescope. So the Hubble Space Telescope is two meters in size, you know, about a little more than this. 
with this technique, the Event Horizon Telescope team used the entire diameter of the Earth as the effective size of the telescope. So that's what let them get the resolution to see the shadow of the black hole. There is a slightly subtler issue that you gain this, you, you gain the sharpness of this image, resolution it's called, but what do you lose? Well, you're not covering the entire Earth with a telescope, right? So you lose something. And the thing you lose is sensitivity. So what you're willing to do is, you're willing to say that, okay, you know, uh, on the broad brush picture is really bad. You can just about tell that there are flowers here. But I'm after this ladybug sitting on a single petal. So if I train my telescope to do that, I'm going to be able to gain resolution while losing what's called signal to noise or overall information about the whole image. So that's how they went after the black hole uh, and could get a very high resolution image. Uh, you know, if you had a poster of Shah Rukh Khan or something and you took it to Delhi, <coughs> then if you had the Hubble sitting here, you could resolve it. With the Event Horizon Telescope, you could take that poster to the moon and you would still resolve it. So that gives you some rough sense. Sorry if that's not your favorite actor. <laughs> so the summary of this Event Horizon Telescope image, you know, I'm sorry, there's only a few things I've been able to tell you about it in five numbers, is that there's a black hole six and a half billion times the mass of the sun uh, that has been observed. We have seen its event horizon. It took eight radio telescopes synchronized with atomic clocks. This black hole lives in a galaxy that's 55 million light years away. So the picture that we are seeing is pretty old, 55 million years old, because that's how long it took light to get to us. This resolution is 4,000 times better than the Hubble, and it's observed in radio waves that are 1.3 millimeters long. So what next will the Event Horizon Telescope do? The first thing they want to do is go after their first target, which is the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. It turns out that even though in the Milky Way it's only thousands of light years away compared to millions, uh, life is a little harder because the black hole is a thousand times less massive. So the event horizon is, a thousand, is thousands, about a thousand times less big. And the center of a galaxy is a real mess. There's stars, dust that are crashing, falling into the black hole, and even further out, they're just obscuring our view. So it's not as easy as you might think, but we are pretty sure there's a black hole. So this is an X-ray picture of the center of our galaxy. Uh, there's you know, various sources of emission. And if you zoom in over here, right in the middle, you, d you don't see anything, but we are pretty sure there's a black hole that's four million times the mass of the sun. And these orbits are stars that have been observed to go around this black hole. So, th so these uh, ellipses are made using data uh, of observations of stars, and some of them get pretty close, but they're still a thousand times away from the event horizon. So that's what the event ho horizon telescope gets us. It's about a thousand times closer than we've ever been to a black hole. So, you know, people all over the world, certainly all over India, um, read a few years ago that right here at Pune is the lead uh, effort of uh, India's team to join another black hole mission, which is one that looks for gravity waves from black holes. So just to complete the story, I'm telling you about the other pieces, other lines of attack on black holes. So gravity waves are ripples of literally of space-time. They're not light, they're not radio waves, they're not water waves, they're not sound waves, they're not like any kind of waves we've seen. You've probably heard about this uh, before, but they're gravity waves that arise when two black holes 
do the death spiral into each other. So these are black holes that are formed. You know, each of them was probably just formed by the death of a single star. And they produce, um, as they spiral in and then merge, they produce a characteristic gravity wave signal that was, uh, you know, measured a few years ago. It received a Nobel Prize almost immediately as these things go. And at this point, they have a dozen confirm about a dozen confirmed events and a few dozen more that are very likely but haven't been definitively um, declared as confirmed. So these are individual star black holes. So the Event Horizon Telescope team is going to go after the Milky Way's black hole, and then it's going to take higher and higher resolution images and learn more about the environments of black holes. They're going to do tests of gravity. It's possible that Einstein theory is not the last word. There are other proposals for how gravity is described around black holes in which the shadow might be a little bit squashed, not exactly circular, or there might be other differences. So they're going to do these tests of these theories. And LIGO and with gravity waves, they're going to do population statistics. They're going to get, you know, hundreds or hundreds of black holes in a few years. And so then we're going to be able to learn about the broader story of how they originate. <coughs> so we'll pause and move on from black holes. So this is a good time if you want to get a samosa or just leave or answer that text message. What I'm going to do is talk about other dark matters. <laughs> And we're going to use this tool of gravitational lensing again. So to see and interpret the image of the black hole, we had to deal with lensing. But my own research involves using lensing as a choice in the sense that if you have a galaxy and you have another galaxy that's much further away, called a quasar sometimes, or just another galaxy, the light is going to get bent around this galaxy, and you might see a ring if you're lucky. It's called an Einstein ring. Einstein himself worked this out, and then he said, ah, what are the chances we're going to see this? Pretty much zero. So he didn't think it was a particularly interesting paper. But <laughs> several decades later, we did get lucky and find these rings. So these rings help us weigh galaxies. So the more the mass of this galaxy, the stronger the bending and the bigger this Einstein ring. So using these Einstein rings, so these are now Hubble Space Telescope images of eight Einstein rings. They're not perfect, as you can see. This is real life. Um, but there's this, a big galaxy sitting in the middle that's produced a ring of a distant galaxy sitting behind it. And if you, let's take this image, you could measure the size of this ring, and, it, and in about five or six steps, you know, with a little more information about uh, this galaxy's redshift and the number of stars it has, you could conclude that there's a bunch of dark matter. Because if you count all the stars that make up this galaxy, it's not enough to make such a big ring. So this is a way to learn about something else that's not visible, not a black hole, but an important constituent of our universe, namely dark matter. What is our universe made of? Planets and stars. Stars and gas make up galaxies. Galaxies make up clusters and superclusters, the biggest things we see in the universe. But that's the visible universe, seen in this map of galaxies. There's, an, there's another part to the universe which we learn about through the gravity. Black holes, as we've seen, but also dark matter, which makes up almost a quad, quarter of all the energy or matter of the universe. 
And there's something even more mysterious that I won't talk about called dark energy, which is making the universe expand faster than we'd expected, which actually dominates the energy of the universe. This dark matter and dark energy, they're all around us. If dark matter is a particle, it's going through our bodies every second. Dark energy is the energy of vacuum, uh, but it fills all space. Moreover, they make up 95% of what the universe is made of. So we really want to learn about them. This is a simulation of what dark matter might look like, but of course we can't observe it directly. So it was discovered by studying how galaxies rotate, and since then the evidence has piled up, in particular through gravitational lensing, but also through studies of the early universe. So what is it really? It's a somewhat embarrassing story for astronomy that it was discovered in the 70s. Even in the 20s and 30s, there were hints of it. Um, <coughs> 1920. Um, but we still don't know quite what it is. You know, just as with black holes, we've come at it a few different ways, we've constrained its properties, but the pursuit for, of dark matter is still pretty hot. What we know is that it behaves like a particle that interacts very weakly. So this is a picture. I, um, I won't have time to, uh, to explain much of this picture, but it's a picture of a galaxy cluster here seen in visible light with the Hubble telescope, here seen in X-ray, uh, in X-rays, where you see this shock front of hot gas. And when you superpose these two images and to it add the map of dark matter that we can make with lensing, then you find that dark matter is sitting here and this hot gas um, is lagging the dark matter. So um, if you study this a little more, then you realize that just this picture, the fact that dark matter and this hot gas don't coincide, is telling you that these two clusters had collided. The shock front, like a bullet, tells you that one of them is moving this way, and the gas has la is lagging the dark matter because the dark matter doesn't interact. It just moves straight through. So it's sort of a visual proof both that dark matter exists and a clue about its nature. So although we don't know for sure that it's a particle or what type of particle, uh, we have some hints about its evolution. Excuse me, I had not planned on this. Um, <clears throat> we haven't found this particle. Do you have a question? Quick one. Mm -hmm. So, what makes it possible to say that uh, there's not a black hole, but there is some enigmatic matter like dark matter? <laughs> yes, that's a great question. In fact, you uh, you anticipated my next slide. So, for 20 years, for theoretical reasons, it was believed that this particle is a particular type of particle that we haven't found yet, but it makes theories work a little better and it has the right properties. It fits the, the evidence from astronomy that it doesn't interact much except through gravity and the weak force. So people build detectors. Although it doesn't interact much, it interacts once in a very rare while. So they built piles of uh, you know, <coughs> uh, noble gases and, and other detectors that were put in mines to catch these dark matter interactions rare interactions. They didn't find it. We waited decades for these experiments to get good enough to find it. They didn't find it. So, you know, nature has a few tricks up its sleeve. It, we thought we had a good theoretical reason for this dark matter particle to be a particular type of particle. It doesn't seem to be that one. It could be another particle. Or now, in theoretical explorations of dark matter, people are stepping back and asking more open questions, including the possibility that it's a primordial black hole. So on our topic of black holes, when the universe was very young, you know, it's about 14 billion years now, when it was seconds old or even earlier, 
It's possible that some parts were over dense enough that they collapsed onto themselves. I'll take other questions later. Uh, and formed um, black holes. And these black holes, their mass could vary r very widely from asteroid size uh, objects to much bigger ones. Um, they could be floating around our galaxy and they could be the dark matter. So it's not easy for the scenario to work, but in principle, it could be part of the dark matter or it could even be all of the dark matter. So most of us still think it's a particular type of particle, <clears throat> but we don't really know. But we have mapped it quite well. So this is a simulation of a galaxy cluster. The recipe to make a galaxy cluster is you take 80% dark matter, 20% stars and gas, and you, you know, set it going on a supercomputer, and the smooth in early universe gets lumpier and lumpier until you get something like this. This is kind of a schematic representation of a real cluster in which each of these dots is a galaxy. And if you can see this faint blue glow, that's the dark matter. So we are mapping this dark matter on, you know, within galaxies, on galaxy clusters. And just to complete the story, on the largest distances in the universe. So this is a galaxy survey I work on. Well, now we've gone from a galaxy cluster, which is, you know, <clears throat> one million light years to distances of hundreds of million light years. And these are the biggest superclusters. These are the biggest voids, cosmic voids shown in blue, um, that we find by mapping this dark matter. So to do this, we actually use the images of millions of galaxies and unravel the path that light took to get to us using some algorithms um, <clears throat> and undo the effect of lensing. And when we do that, this dark matter map is, re is revealed. And you know, if you look more closely and you go back to the actual light images, you can see massive galaxy clusters uh, where we have this big blob of dark matter and massive, almost empty regions where we have these voids. And on the larger scale, using a much lower resolution <coughs> uh, data set and technique, this is a dark matter map, you know, projected of almost the entire universe. So this uses the cosmic back background radiation that's been coming to us from pretty much the edge of the observable universe. And you can see the resolution is much weaker, but this is a m map of the dark matter. So, you know, one has different ways of seeing. This is all the story from astronomy. There's also particle accelerators. This is the LHC, the big accelerator in Switzerland that collides particles together. And in those collisions, there's the hope that we might produce some dark matter particles and infer their properties uh, you know, much more directly that way. But both these spots are moving forward, and we hope to find uh, a lot more about this dark matter in the coming decade. I've not talked much about theory. <coughs> you know, Einstein's theory, as worked out by this German um, theorist, Karl Schwarzschild, about whom I heard an interesting story uh, from Schumach. Uh, uh, just before this talk, they'd figured out the basic properties of the black hole. And there's been a lot of interesting developments, including the simulations that I, that I showed you. But a lot of recent progress has been driven by these wonderful telescopes and data analysis algorithms. So we really have to keep observing the universe, because you can't rely on theorists too much. Otherwise, you have these kind of situations this is embarrassing. By my calculations, the universe should have collapsed on, in on itself last Wednesday. How are we still here? And you know, when you hear such you know, pure mathematical theorists talk, they sometimes seem actually surprised by simple facts of existence that don't agree with their theories. So instead, you know, we must keep um, in parallel anyway, looking at the universe. Can anybody read this? 
I am a galaxy written using actual images of galaxies suitably rotated. So, um, so we should keep observing the universe and you should come back and hear more about black holes and other interesting topics here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bhuvanesh, for that wonderful talk. Uh, so we'll take some questions. Um, okay. well, let's start from here and then we'll move. Ah, I thought. Go ahead. Maybe you can repeat. Um, good evening, sir. So, in one of the slides, you mentioned 80% of cold ma or dark matter and 20% of stars and gases. So, I found that a bit of surprising, like cold dark matter. So, is there anything hot dark matter? Uh, uh, so, yeah. I left in a, 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 you know, sometimes we use uh, simple English words in a very particular technical way. So that's the way astronomers describe this dark matter that interacts quite weakly and is moving relatively slowly. So that's what we mean by cold. Uh, there are candidates for what's called hot dark matter, things that move much more rapidly like uh, neutrinos, but they're not considered very viable. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, I want to, sir, I want to ask that uh, you know, the Einstein's theory, the, uh, why the Einstein's theory, uh, the, big, uh, the black holes which have very high mass and uh, gravita uh, gravitational force, they can uh, le lead to the formation of uh, wormholes also? Sorry, uh, I, I can't hear you very well. Maybe you could hold the mic a little further away. Yeah, go ahead. So you're saying, are there other things that are bigger? The, uh, by the Einstein's theory, the, uh, you mean that the, um, uh, the bigger black holes with b uh, much more mass and much gravitational force, the, uh, does the, can make a wormhole? So he's asking about wormhole. Oh yes, wormhole, yeah. right. So wormhole is a fascinating concept. I find it very cool too. It probably doesn't exist, but there is a slim theoretical possibility that if you have two black holes and say a certain topology of the universe, uh, then uh, you, uh, uh, the, um, you know, there are two singularities that could be connected and you could use them to uh, do some interesting things, like you could reach the other side of the universe using like a really short shortcut. So <coughs> they have, uh, they're really interesting concepts and you don't need a black hole to be all that massive. You just need a lot of very, how to put it, very improbable things to work out uh, to form a wormhole. And if you do, most likely they would be very short-lived. Um, <coughs> but it's a fun speculative idea to think about. Yes, sir. Um, uh, as we say that... Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you did go through a wormhole, you or your, your favorite pet or your favorite experiment, the spaghettification effect would make it very unlikely you'd come out on the other side alive. And there's other effects that happen inside a wormhole, yeah. So oh. As we say that uh, it's a space-time fabric, right? So every, uh, anything that has mass warps the space-time fabric. So what if it tears, like a cloth? What happens then? And also, can you tell us more about Webb Telescope, which is going to be launched in... Sorry, let me, let me just answer the first one. So uh, the space-time fabric is very hard to tear. You know, we each create a little dimple in the space-time fabric because we each have mass. But black holes, at least classically, are singularities that create these rips in space-time. So there? Yeah. Hello, sir. Uh, the image of the black hole that you showed had brighter spot in the lower half. Shouldn't it be on the left or right half? 
because that's the part. <coughs> that's the part that's coming towards us. But because of this lensing uh, effect that I mentioned, that the light rays are bent on their way to us, where they appear is not where they actually are. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, maybe here. Let's give younger people preference. So you said that as the mass of a black hole increases, the size of the event horizon also increases. So from the size of the event horizon, can we also derive the mass of the black hole? Is it possible to do that? Good question. <clears throat> That's exactly what the event horizon team did. The size of the shadow is a certain factor of the event horizon. And that's how they inferred that the mass of the black hole is six and a half billion solar masses. They actually settled the debate because previously there were two different methods to get this mass and their answers were different. So your idea gave, settled that debate. So uh, my question is, does everything in space ends in dark ma black hole or uh, there is new beginning in black hole? This is, as they say, above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really know what happens to space and time as you go through a black hole. You, know, you need a theory of quantum gravity to understand the microscopic structure around the singularity. In Einstein's theory, it's like an exact singularity. There's this invisible event horizon and, you know, it warped space-time and then a point where all the matter is concentrated. But if we develop a complete theory uh, of gravity and microscopic scales that, that, are, that, uh, that include quantum, quantum effects, then we might learn exactly what happens. Good evening, sir. So, uh, if uh, if we see the cosmic microwave background of the universe, we could see the denser parts and the less denser parts. So, uh, my question is that um, the more denser part will form the stars first and then galaxies and then the black holes will form. So, how are primordial black holes formed? By uh, just the... Uh, collapsing of gas and dust and not forming star in between. Did the chicken come first or the egg? <laughs> Did the stars form and then gather together, together to form the galaxy or was there a giant gas cloud that was forming a galaxy and as it formed the galaxies formed the stars and the biggest stars which happened to, to die youngest die and form a black hole. We don't know the exact sequence of events yep. between the first generation of stars and black holes and galaxies. It's a very interesting area of study. Um, <coughs> but primordial black holes um, came well before any of that. Uh, when the universe was a second old or so, it was you know, a plasma that was made up just of elementary particles. And um, surprisingly enough, even though it was this hot plasma, uh, things that, that happened to be a little more dense could pretty easily have formed a black hole. They just had to be quite, quite dense relative to the background. Okay. Um. Yeah. So uh, my question is on the black hole image. So uh, like some horizonless uh, ultra-compact object can also have image similar to the black hole. So how can we be so sure that this is a like black hole image? Like, yeah, <coughs> you try hiding six and a half billion times the sun of material <laughs> without letting it glow. Or There's not a very short answer to this question. It does involve some acceptance that we know the physics of material. So if you take a lot of material, <coughs> it's almost certainly a gas in galaxies, whether it's a glowing, it's obviously not glowing stars, so it would be some other kind of gas. 
Our telescopes are so good that if you take a bunch of gas like that, there's like a dozen different ways we can see it. Radio waves because of electrons zipping around, x-rays if the gas is too hot, regular light if the atoms have transitions under them. So by any physical mechanism, we don't know how to hide that much material um, without seeing it. But in this case, Einstein's theory tells us that uh, you know, the, it tells us the, sh the size of the shadow. Um, and so, uh, and you know, using not only this observation but other observations, we know how much matter there is. So just theoretically, if you take that much material inside that smaller region, uh, th we also know that gravity, um, you cannot escape the pull of gravity pulling you into a point. So, sorry, I don't have a short answer to this, but we are pretty certain it could not, it couldn't not be a black hole. So, do the particles with the negative mass exist? I want to say tachyons. Uh, they certainly exist in the equations of theorists, uh, but uh, not as far as I know in the real world. Yeah. Maybe here. Sir, uh, as we see in the Einstein ring, uh, it gives us evidence about the dark matter. So is there any uh, evidence of dark matter related to the time dilation? This is my first question. And the second one is, uh, is quantum tunneling possible in the black hole? So the dark matter story is kind of independent of time dilation. You know, where there are very heavy bodies, they do warp space time and they do dilate time. But the way we study dark matter and the way it's distributed is a separate story. And your other question was about quantum tunneling. Um, you know, quantum tunneling can occur in various situations in physics. Um, but um, there's no particular scenario on the black hole where it's been, no, you know, it's, it's certainly, uh, th there's no evidence of it or uh, a likelihood that it would occur. So, so yeah, I don't have much more to say about it. So there's one question one which question? is coming from our online viewers. Uh, so this is Harshada Gura. She is asking how dangerous are primordial black holes? And if there is any such black hole present near our solar system, could it do something? Yeah. <coughs> I made one attempt to keep you up at night already with spaghettification. <laughs> so you know when this uh, CERN, the particle accelerator, went on, uh, there was worries that these uh, high energy particle collisions could create black holes. And it's not unreasonable to think that when you have a black hole which has such a strong gravity, it would, you know, pull in stuff, it would grow, it would swallow the Earth. But actually, like, it's a fun question to ask. Suppose the moon became a black hole and it passed through our atmosphere. What would we see? You know, the moon is, you know, I don't know, it's uh, many millions times smaller than the sun. So its event horizon, you all know, would be many million times smaller than a kilometer. In other words, it's, uh, a, a, you know, even a black hole as big as the size of the moon would have a, a, a radius of influence that's less than a millimeter. So in that sense, if a black hole was moving really slowly and somehow liked you a lot and started to circle around you and slowly, you know, ate away like one of these uh, flesh-eating bacteria, then maybe it could hurt you. But otherwise, it would take a really big black hole to slowly go right through Pune uh, to do serious damage. And <clears throat> but it's nevertheless true that, you know, many branches of science tell us that we're lucky to be alive. It's all because of probability. There are 
we know there are black holes that are 10 times bigger than the mass of the sun. It's just that the probability that one of them is going to, you know, decide to change its trajectory and move towards us, it's just vanishingly low. But it's possible. <laughs> yeah. uh, we know that, uh, or rather, because of its effects, uh, indirectly, we can say that uh, dark matter does really exist, and you also mentioned in your talk that we have, uh, we are not able to, uh, if my understanding is correct, we are not able to account for most of the gravity that is required to hold our galaxies together, because of which we need to consider this unknown particle that is causing the extra uh, gravity. And uh, so uh, in so many years and, you know, technology has got better and we haven't been able to, uh, you know, detect indirectly or directly uh, dark matter. Um, and so is it possible that, you know, um, we are uh, talking about possibilities in our three-dimensional space-time continual. So outside our, from outside our three-dimensional continual, if, you know, if you say from a, a mega universe point of view, there is, uh, th there are other normal objects which are made up of normal matter, which are influencing our space-time continual and causing negative curvature. So literally negative curvature which is causing our galaxies to you know uh, stick together and you know um, exist in that manner and so it's just an illusion and the matter that is causing the gravity is not really in our space-time continual. Uh. Yeah, you gave a really nice summary of the current state of dark matter research. When you were doing that, I was thinking, it's not really fair that this guy's going to ask me a question, because I couldn't have given such a clear summary. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer to your question. Um, the negative curvature that arises, you know, in cosmology, there's a way that we describe the curvature of space-time of the whole universe. And that can be positive or negative or zero. So we believe we live in a universe that's got almost no spatial curvature. But if their bodies are, you know, made up of other types of matter, uh, I'm not sure they would produce uh, such a negative curvature. Um, I think it would just circle back to the usual story about dark matter. I should say that, you know, while we are talking about degrees of certainty, you know, <coughs> we are 99.99999 certain about the existence of black holes. Uh, dark matter, you know, most, uh, you know, 90% of the community believes that dark matter exists and has these properties. But uh, we're far from, from certain about it. It's still possible that it could be some really contrived um, behavior of gravity that we haven't yet uh, figured out. Uh, it could be something completely else. Can I get this? Uh, no, good evening, sir. Uh, you mentioned primordial black holes. So uh, my question is, uh, how much of uh, the, I mean, uh, the contemporary, I should say probably, <laughs> black holes, and the primordial black holes, how much uh, different are they? And uh, how much of uh, the properties of dark matter and primordial black holes do we know, uh, so as to come to the conclusion or hypothesis probably, uh, that primordial black holes could be the dark matter? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, we know that contemporary black holes, as you um, name them, uh, exist. There's a mechanism to form them. When big stars die, they pretty much have to form these black holes. Primordial black holes is, is still a speculative idea. It's a hypothesis. And of course, it's very different from a dark matter particle because <coughs> they are bigger, they have much stronger gravity close to them. So they have many types of these in ranges and mass have actually been ruled out. Because if, if there were enough of them around, they would have produced lensing effects um, that we would have seen. So the, 
there's still some properties in particular ranges of mass where they could sneak in. But, um, but they would be detectable in principle. That's, it's something that we can go after, just mainly because of their bending of light properties. Um, maybe one here. So you mentioned about the dark matter and the dark energy probably forming the 95% of the universe. Uh, are they evenly distributed across the universe or the distribution is uneven? Question number one. And second, uh, so far we have not been able to detect. Is it possible that we may be in the area wherein the, um, these two energies and uh, dark energy and matter probably are not so prevalent as they are in the other part of the universe? Okay. <clears throat> dark energy is very close to completely smoothly distributed and dark matter is very unevenly distributed for the most part it's distributed not quite for the most part but to a large extent it's distributed the way the, the light the visible universe is distributed where there are heavier things that pull in more stuff and so there's more dark matter the possibility that we live in a special part of the universe, um, you know, Co Copernicus tried to talk out of this habit that we are the center of the universe, but even many of my colleagues still ask this question, that could this puzzle in the data be explained because where we are there's more or less dark matter. Uh, there seems to be no evidence for that because there are many measurements we can do. We seem to live in a pretty typical part of the universe. Um, so, like in the particle accelerator, uh, there are uh, attempts to find dark matter being released. So, like that, um, <coughs> after the gravitational waves, uh, there's this neutron star neutron star collision, uh, which are at times followed up with electromagnetic observations. So, isn't there an uh, experiment uh, feasible to search for dark matter released? Uh, during those EM events. So could you say the last bit again? <coughs> when uh, neutron star m uh, collisions are observable in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, aren't there uh, proposals to search for dark matter uh, uh, during those events? I see. First, let me say that the questions you're asking are really great. You know, I feel like uh, one of those tennis stars, you know, Federer or Djokovic. You guys are the best audience ever. <laughs> 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 New York is my favorite play to play, place to play tennis. Um, but, uh, uh, but really, these are, 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 are great questions. Uh, about your question about neutron star mergers, um, you know, these are very compact objects made up of regular matter. Um, so <clears throat> if you ask, you know, in our solar system, why don't we feel dark matter? Doesn't it perturb the orbit of Jupiter and even the moon, you know? It does. But in these environments, it's much, much less than regular matter. Because in the centers of galaxies where stars form, there's a much higher concentration of regular particles because regular particles can cool by radiating and concentrate whereas dark matter, because it doesn't interact with light and stuff, it can't cool. So the long and short of it is that when you have very dense objects like this, the presence of dark matter plays almost no role. Like, it wouldn't affect the things we observe. Okay. Uh, let's take one last question, which is uh, coming from the online audience. How do you calculate the exact path of gravitationally lensed light? Um, to calculate the path of light, you need to know how space-time is bent by massive bodies. So if you have a black hole, it's pretty easy. You just need to assume or infer from other data how much mass it has. Once you do that, Einstein's theory tells you exactly how it bends space-time and then you can either do a simple calculation or you can simulate the path of a photon. 
But in general, it's pretty hard because gravity is a long-range force. So the bending of a photon is determined not just by the mass of my fist, but of my body and the mass of the Earth and the walls. So you have to calculate the uh, you have to do a global calculation of all the mass distribution in order to figure out the path of a single photon. So we use different levels of approximation uh, to do it. So I'm sure there are many more questions in the audience, but I think uh, we'll have to wrap it up here. So let's thank once again Bhuvnesh for this wonderful <laughs> talk and also answering all your questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks a lot uh, to the audience for coming as well. We'll have a series of public talks which will continue throughout the year. Uh, so please keep up the enthusiasm as well. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>